I have no formula for winning the race. Everyone runs in her own way, or his own way. Then where does the power come from to see the race to its end? From within. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a voiceover artist, uh, writer, producer, and host here in Los Angeles, California. Uh, And I can't tell you guys, uh, there have been many films that we've done over the years that we've enjoyed uh, and have been personal favorites of ours, but this may be one of the most personal favorites, maybe number one or number two on my list, just below Citizen Kane of um, personal movies that affected my life and changed my life and still does to this day. So I'm incredibly excited to talk about this with Steve. It's funny. I've heard you talk about this film so much on Top 10 Show. It's Mm -hmm. come up all the time and your deep love for it. And of course, I've always loved the movie. This was a movie that I watched over and over again after it came out. And I don't know what it might have been on Showtime or something. And it's just, Mm -hmm. I must have seen it 20 times. And then I don't think I've seen it in at least 20 years. Wow. Like, And what was so strange about revisiting it was how indelible certain moments were. I knew them perfectly. Even before we sat down to watch it, I could think, I could picture certain moments because they're so profound. And then now being more of a filmmaker and thinking about film in a different way, I saw all sorts of stuff that I didn't see before. So I'm really glad we're revisiting it. And I don't think that we've actually said the name of this movie. (laughs) I mean, anyone who's looked at the title of this episode knows that the film we are doing is Chariots of Fire, 1980, directed by Hugh Hudson about the 1924 Olympic Games. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, uh, Steve, as I said just a second ago, a few seconds ago, it's just, it's just. I you 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 call it. I, I mention it all the time on the Cinephiles because people. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, on the top ten show because we don't give this movie enough love, enough credit. People talk about the top ten sports movies, and this rarely gets in the conversation amongst the most uh, recent critics or critics that are out there nowadays. And I think it still holds up. I think it absolutely deserved its best picture. It was an independent small film out of Britain, ser- an underdog itself. The film was like the underdogs in the film to a, to a degree uh, and it won that Oscar and nobody nobody saw it coming and I remember this was a seminal moment in my life because this was a film that I cheered on for months before it got nominated then when it got nominated I cheered for it to win and when it won it was one of the most satisfactory moments in this young cinephile's life uh, and so it's there's just so much about this movie that uh, uh, still uh, uh, moves me to this day for so many reasons. What's so crazy about it is that one of the movies it beat for the Oscar is a movie we just talked about uh, like uh, two months ago, which is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yes, yes. Be- beats Raiders. And so while I I don't know if I'm with you, I, I it's like, I love the I movie. I love are. the movie. But well, and, it's, and it, what's really funny is what you said about it being one of the most go-to movies. I know you haven't put this on your list of the best films, yeah. but it's one of your most special films to you. And I, I and, and and it's funny because Raiders is, of course, for me, one of my absolutely go-to films, but this is such a special, unique, different, interesting, warm, powerful, profound movie. Yeah. And it really does come out of nowhere. And, and in fact, Hugh Hudson, the director, I, 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 did you mention you just did a one hit wonder show on yeah, top we did. 10? Was he, yeah. was he on the list? I couldn't remember. He, he was number six for me on my list or number five, somewhere yeah. on there because this one won a best picture. So the idea that he would do more things that would, you know, be up for awards and things of that nature was certainly in the conversation and the fact that it never happened. And He's still directing today, by the way. He did a film last year that didn't do that well. He's never been able to recapture uh, that uh, glory of uh, the time of that film. And I recently read a, a bit of a deep dive on Ben Cross's interviews, who plays Harold Abrams in the film. And Ben has talked about how this film was an albatross around his neck for many years as an actor. Because he's like, I've done 90 projects, but all anyone wants to talk about is this film, uh, a la Citizen Kane for Orson 
Orson Welles, right? Yeah. I've done another fil- other films, you know, but this is the one they want to talk about. The same thing, Hugh Hudson, him, apparently him and Ben would commiserate about this movie all the time because they enjoyed that it brought them so much fame and success. But by the same token, the fact that they couldn't live up to the promise of this film ever again with any of their other projects has haunted them for three decades. It's such a, it's such a crazy thing. You know, we're, you, you're, you're so blessed to have been in a movie that was so profound and affected people so much. And yet it's a very small part of their lives. And yet it hangs over them forever. Uh, do you remember how you first came to it? Yes, I, I was going to Catholic school at the time, the only year I was ever in Catholic school. And uh, they took us to go see this movie on a school field trip. Um, and I sat down in the theater and I remember there's a bunch of people I can't remember the kid. I can't remember the kid's name, but I remember that he was a little bit of a heavier kid with a bowl haircut. Uh, we were kind of the nerds of the class, so we hung out with each other uh, and watched this film. And I remember we were in the upper balcony of the movie theater. That's where they had put all, because they bought the tickets for us. Remember, it's a Catholic school. It's a religious movie to a degree. So we're all sitting there uh, watching it, and I just was transfixed, you know, because I had started becoming a little bit of an Anglophile maybe a year or two before watching PBS stuff. My dad not understanding why I was into Shakespeare at such a young age, things of that nature. So this kind of hit all those buttons of being into sports, which is something I share with my dad at a young age, and also it being set in England and being such a purely English film. It was uh, just phenomenal to uh, experience it. And uh, like I said, moved me greatly. With, with me, I, I like I said, I know I watched it over and over and over again on TV. I think I saw it in the theater, but I am not sure. Mm. It, it, it's a crazy thing. You know, we've started every single podcast with this question of how did you come to the film? And it's crazy to me that for almost every movie we've done, <laughs> I remember. Even yeah. if I saw it in the theater as a kid, I can remember. These movies had such profound effects on me. This one, I'm not 100% sure. I mm. think I saw it in the theater. I don't know. A um, little bit of pre-production. This starts with producer David Putnam, and it's his idea. I took a look at some of his credits. The one that cracks me up is a movie I think we've mentioned a couple times, not because it's good, but Bugsy Malone. Yeah. It's a movie that he produced. He also produced Ridley Scott's first film, The Duelist, and he produced the Alan Parker film Midnight Express, and later on he did The Killing Fields. So the, he's a very strong producer. He comes up with the idea. He brings in Colin Welland to be the uh screenwriter and he brings in Hugh Hudson to direct and this is his first feature but he is an extremely experienced filmmaker no, normally when we talk about a first time director we're talking about someone who really is just starting out or they're an actor turned director or a cinematographer turned director or a screenwriter turned director who doesn't necessarily have that much experience directing Hugh Hudson on the other hand he began directing films in the 60s he had been he had directed tons of documentaries his mm. first documentary that he was hired to do was on egg cartons <laughs> and he did documentaries on cars and all just all sorts of odd small documentaries and the DP that he brought on on his egg carton documentary is David Watkins who goes who who they work with a ton and then becomes quite a famous cinematographer and then of course he hires him to do chariots of fire yeah. um uh and uh after doing all these documentaries, he started to do tons of commercial work, and he worked at Ridley Scott's company for Ridley Scott doing commercials, when because that's where Ridley Scott started. And so then Ridley Scott goes to make uh, Duelist with uh, David Putnam, and uh, and that's kind of how he gets into that realm. And, he, and at this point, Hugh Hudson had left Ridley Scott's company, and he was working at doing commercials for Alan Parker's company. <laughs> and it's Alan Parker that made Midnight Express, also David Putnam, and Hudson was the second unit director on that film, and that's how Putnam thought of him for Chariots of Fire. Um, but this that also is, explains that also explains why Brad Davis is in the movie. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's this, you know, he, he gets put in this position, and this is, this is not a beginner film. Hmm. I'm, and, and in particular, they wanted this to feel like a big movie, but the budget's only $5 million and they shot it in 10 weeks. So to do a big period piece on a small budget on a short schedule with a first time director, that's a tough thing to do. That's a lot to ask. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and maybe because he was used to commercials and used to documentaries, he kind of was knew how to work fast, knew how mm -hmm. to, you know, get what he needed and move on. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of a, a fascinating way to start. 
Well, you know, as a producer, you find once you understand what the budget is and once you understand the production schedule is going to be, then you then you know which director to go and try and go and get for your film because you know that they can work within the parameters that have that have been laid out uh, for your movie. So you have to say it's a stroke of genius for Putnam, who also won the Best Picture, I think, for The Killing Fields or, or Hang Ass Nor certainly won Best uh, Supporting Actor for that right. uh, film. So certainly had the magic touch in the early '80s, knew exactly which director to come bring in uh, for. This project, and you could argue the film does feel almost like a semi-documentary about these two guys and what they went through in real life, uh, 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 representing uh, the UK. Absolutely. Um, would you like to get on the track and start running this race? I will say, uh, want to do two things of pre-production real quick oh, for please. Ben Cross and Ian Charlson, who are the runners in the film, Eric Little and Harold Abrams. Ian Cross, this was his first big film that he had gotten. Uh, he auditioned for it, and then he trained for three months after the audition without knowing he was going to book it. He oh, wow. trained for three months, and then afterwards, they trained for another three months, uh, him and Eric Little, and they were running, and they thought they were in great shape, uh, and then they showed up, and the gentleman who put them through their paces i think was a former runner for the uk and just kind of did all this work with them him and eric little um and uh abram said it or i mean uh, uh ben cross said it really bothered him that eric Lit uh, that uh, ian charleston had to beat them beat him in the movie in that pinnacle scene because he was actually faster than ian charleston and that was frustrating to kind of have to run behind him a little bit but they did a lot of work and all these guys coming together and that nature and the same thing with ian charleston he had been a bit established already uh so he had had to do a lot of training on the side then they brought him in uh and, and you know ben cross thought other people were going to get this film there was a lot of uh, famous actors who were interested in being this role uh but he really wanted it and putnam told him later the reason i cast you is because you had this chip on your shoulder because you would come from uh, uh immigrant parents or half uh, half of immigrant parents uh and you had had to struggle as a poor kid to pay your way through drama school so you had this chip on your shoulder when you came into the audition that i wanted to see from harold abrams so it wasn't that difficult for you to play this part, a natural part. And I needed someone who could get it quickly because we had such a short shooting schedule. And so that was how uh, uh, Ben Cross found his way into the film and Ian Charlson as well. That's that's so great. And, th and the one thing that I saw, it's funny, we just did uh, Field of Dreams. Yeah. And there's all the talk in Field of Dreams about Kevin Costner as a natural athlete. Right. And we said that we've heard this. You always hear this about movies. Apparently, this one, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like right. These were not natural athletes. No, they were out no. of shape. This was really hard for them. <laughs> like they, yeah. they, they really, really had to train to get to the mm -hmm. place where they could look like real runners. Yeah. Um, uh, we hear church sounds over the credits at the very beginning, and the movie, uh, strangely enough, starts in 1978 at a funeral. We are here today to give thanks for the life of Harry Abrahams to honor the legend. Now there are just two of us, young Aubrey Montague and myself. Of course, you're immediately in a place of reverence. It's a funeral. Uh, the gentleman delivering it, you're going to see both the two men who, who uh, you know, catch each other's eye as the older gentleman still alive who remember these moments. Uh, you, you're going to see them in younger uh, 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 situations uh, as the film goes on. And then you get just this transition. That's amazing. It's almost like a chorus in a Shakespeare play, right? Totally. Uh, you know, it's almost like the beginning of Henry V, laying the groundwork for what you're going to see. And then, you know, uh, you know, here's our play. And boom, through the door and we start who can close our eyes and remember those few young men with hope in our hearts and wings on our heels. It's such a great transition to this fantastic score from Vangelis for Chariots of Fire, seeing these feet hit the water and the joy in their faces and the 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 beach and the uh, sands, the wet sands, uh, you know, splashing onto their clothes as they run. 
all of it just incredibly uplifting and slow motion uh, just just gets you right into the mood of the movie. It's such a unique opening. And it, what's so interesting about it is it's kind of this shot that's out of time. We mm. don't know exactly when this happened. It's not part of the story. We never see this run on the beach as part of our story. It, is, point, this, yes. it is this moment, a, a symbolic moment of the joy and the competition and the spirit of running. And the camera pass, pans past our characters and we see each of them, which, you know, it kind of focuses a little on each one and you even get a sense of who they are in this moment and i cannot overstress the power of this music mm -hmm. particularly if you were alive in the early 80s this is one of those pieces of music that got played so much you were sick of it yeah but it is an unbelievable completely standout piece of music and, and and with Vangelis or Vangelis, and I always forget which one it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but this is all him. This is all him yeah. on a synth synthesizer. This is early synth. He would play just to picture. And one of the things I found out about this, this piece of music is almost not in the film. Yeah, because they had found uh, Hugh Hudson loved Vangelis, and he he had found some piece of his from something else that they loved, and they put that against this uh, beach scene mm. and Van Gellis went, you know, I kind of like to write something new. And they're like, no, no, what we have is perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Don't do anything. And he went off and he wrote something new anyway. And he yeah. brought it in and he said, look, I want you to, I want to play this thing for you with the beach scene. And they're like, no, we, we got it. We did nothing is going to be as good. He's like, please let me play this. And he played them the piece. And that's how we get that Chariots of Fire theme. I, was, I will say this. I recently bought a record player a few months ago. The fifth album I bought was uh, a Chariots of Fire off Amazon, a new copy of it. Because I've had it in, I've had it in cassette, CD, uh, and every form it comes in. And I bought this film in every form it comes in. Because there's just something about that music. Uh, even today, this afternoon, actually, I listened to the soundtrack again to get me ready for the show as I was playing my video games because it just kind of like gets you into that place of aspiration uh, and what it's a year later that he does the Blade Runner score which is an incredible right. score as well so uh, Vangelis certainly in uh, once again in the early 80s just two back to back fantastic scores synth heavy scores yeah and, and it's such an interesting thing because there are some synth scores that are so dated oh, yeah. just like they're cringeworthy and this one really isn't with there are a couple of um, cues that bother me a little bit in that way, yeah. but for the most part, it's, it's just amazing. We can't also dis, uh, discount the fact that this is coming out right at the beginning of the jogging craze, of the craze <laughs> of running and that kind of stuff that's starting to consume America as well with Jim Fix's book and Nike putting these shoes out, things of that nature. So uh, jogging as, uh, uh, mm -hmm. what's his face, uh, Will Ferrell might say in Anchorman, it was becoming a big deal right in the early 80s too. That never occurred to me. That's a great, great point. Um, and then we do this thing that's really interesting, which is that the film has a double flashback because we started in the church in the yeah. 70s, and then we flash back. The moment is like right before the Olympics, we think, and, mm -hmm. and we hear a guy writing a letter which flashes us again back to the beginning of college at Cambridge. And uh, we see uh, these people arriving and we hear about Harold. Mind you, Harold's hardly changed at all. As intense as ever. Now as then, having a go at anybody who stands in his way. I do want to say this real quick too. Uh, this is Aubrey Montague, who was actually who is also giving the opening speech at the church. So he's ah. narrating this as it goes along. Another thing to let you know for those who who've only seen the the film once or the American version, there's a British version. And in the British version, when they're coming down the game plank, and he says as as intense as ever, it cuts to a scene of cricket where they're playing. All the guys are playing indoors in a room, and Harold Abrams is arguing about a call on the cricket that they're playing indoor of a room I'm, with his other companions. I've, I've heard about the cricket scene, but I've never yep. seen it. So that's really yep. interesting. What do you so like better? Work. Which one uh, do you like better? I, I'm partial to this one because the cricket scene feels uh, too familiar before we've introduced all the characters. Mm. And so I don't think it works where they place it in the film in the British version. But then again, if I'm a British person and I see a cricket scene, maybe it feels nat more natural to me or I know these characters. Or I know the history of these characters more. If I grew up in Britain, maybe it feels more natural for a British audience. But for an American like me, I, I like the gangplank into uh, giving the luggage to the uh, two World War One veterans. And the first thing they find out as they meet is that they're both runners and this this first mm. 
uh, lines between them is great. I run. Really? So do I. I'm surprised you can find the time. The only trouble is I can't stand getting beaten. How about you? I don't know. I've never lost. I've never lost. <laughs> <laughs> and he's um, like, Montague stops for a second. I just, I've never even conceived of that possibility. Right? <laughs> well, and, the, and even the, the arrogance to s- just yeah. say that. The <laughs> simplicity of it all. <laughs> Well, and this is, you know, this is great screenwriting because we, oh, we, we get to know this Harold guy real quick. Yes. Um, and good. he is a difficult person. Like he, he is, uh, you are drawn to him, but there are things that he does that it's just like, oh man. Yeah. Um, and, and as you say, there are these two World War One veterans who help them with their bags. And this is the one of, one of the things that I had remembered so clearly, even though it's a really small moment, is that these guys, one of the, both obviously have been wounded. One of them has this apparatus on his face and they're being super um, servile yeah. to these guys, you know, just helping, can I help you with your bags? And can I do this for you, sir? And there are looks from our young students at the soldiers. And you can feel, because one of the things about this film is it's it's set very soon after World War I. And yes. our young guys were just too young to serve in the war. Mm-hmm. And this moment of guilt that they feel, and then the moment after they get in the car where the soldiers then say, you know, talk some smack about them. Yeah, that's what we fought the bleeding war, something to give give shits like them a decent education. Yeah, and yeah. the thing is, this comes back in the dinner scene we're just about to get to, Steve, because the reason that they're able to be accepted into the college at this time is because these World War One these people got called into service for World War One, so it created s- slots for them that might normally have been taken for people who had stuck around longer or had gone, you know, uh, it st- it stayed in college. So there's even more of a sense of guilt in that moment that's kind of yeah. giving you a window into what's coming a little bit later and the importance of what they want to do as representatives of their nation. We arrive at Cambridge. Uh, we go inside and immediately, and they kind of, they're the people that are signing them in, older gentlemen in suits. And that comes up right here. He says, you know, oh, did you, were you in France? And Harold says, no, join too late. Yeah. And they say, oh, bad luck. There's many a dead man would have liked to share of it, bad luck or not. You're right there, son. And then... He calls him Laddie. Well, Mr. Rogers Ratcliffe, I ceased to be called Laddie when I took up the King's Commission. Is that clear? Yes, uh, Mr. Abrahams, quite clear. Uh, Now, Steve, I'm going to tell you what you said a couple seconds ago. This is why I love him, and this is why I connect to him and relate to him. This idea, you see him as a difficult person. I don't. I see him as a guy who has had, and he says it later on, you know, there's a... There's a, a coldness in a look or a, a, the, a, the handshake. There's like a less of a strength of the handshake because they're they don't like Jews. Uh, that's this is what he carries with him is this chip on his shoulder because people condescend to him and he's been condescended to because of his heritage and his race and so he carries it with him. And as a Latino kid in an all white Catholic school, uh, you know, a majority white town in Virginia at the time, uh, this was something I carried with me. I sensed it. People made fun of my father's accent. People made fun of me for being Latino. Like these are things that I endured. And so I felt a natural affinity with Harold. And when I see him push back at that guy, that is that is the difference between the old English and the new English. And he is saying to him, don't condescend to me, respect me as a person who is who is of older age here going and handling the, uh, going and coming to uh, uh, be a student here, uh, you know. And so I don't mind that he does it. And uh, I think they were a bit condescending. So he called him out and he spends the rest of the movie calling people out for that. And I I respect the consistency of his character for that. I want to say this in the right way, Mm. because everything you've said is totally true. I 100% agree with it. Mm. I think the guy was clearly condescending towards him. Mm. I think that he has experienced anti-Semitism. And, you know, as a Jewish person, it's not like I'm going to say that that's not a valid thing. Of course it is. But I still say he's a difficult person. (laughs) <laughs> is that it's not that it's not motivatable. It's not right. that he's not likable. It's that he is, he will strike back immediately. And that kind of a person can be difficult to be around. They can. I mean, you know, people, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean is that, sure. is that to be his friend, you know, it's like, well, this guy is not, he doesn't have a lot of soft edges. He has a lot of sharp corners. Right. It's not that he's wrong about what he's sensing, mm-hmm. but he mm-hmm. is also looking for it. And that, well, and think- the f- feeling of, that all the time causes his back to be up 
all the time. That's a great point. Uh, and I think that's what the film does uh, throughout the throughout his arc is to take away that hubris, to challenge that cockiness, that self-belief and undercut it a little bit to hu- uh, to humble him and to make him more of a human character to like by the end of the movie. So you're absolutely uh, uh, correct in that way that he is he is uh, not an easy guy to like at the beginning of the movie. Remember, he's a young man coming to college. So, uh, you know, you change from who you are then to who you are later. And it's a good juxtaposition to what we get from Eric Little, which we'll get to in just a little bit. How Literally, he's going nice, to yeah. say exactly the same thing. Yeah, and yeah. It's brilliant. It makes you it, it makes you like a look at both of these men and see the both sides of the human experience. Well, and that's one of the fascinating things about the structure of this film is that this is a film about two different guys who barely meet. Yeah. And it is a sports movie where although they there is some competition between them, the competition between our main characters is not what the movie's about either. No. You know, it's we're following two separate stories. So uh we go into Cambridge, which by the way was not shot inside uh, Keys College in Cambridge because oh. Cambridge didn't want them to shoot there. They didn't think that the movie would make them look good and they deeply regretted it after. <laughs> um, but, good. <laughs> uh, 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 and we go into this. It looks like sort of the welcoming dinner for the new students and everyone is in their white ties and they're standing, be- sitting below a huge plaque on the wall yeah. with hundreds of names. And these are the names of the men who died in the war yeah and uh there is a gentleman who is you know the head of the school in some way and he's making a speech yeah and the weight i think of his speech and what it how it sits on our main characters he yeah. says names which will be only names to you but which to us summon up face after face full of honesty and goodness zeal and vigor and intellectual promise the flower of a generation the glory of england and they died for england and all that england stands for such a powerful speech man like you just said and this is lindsay anderson who is a legendary acting teacher in britain and had like you know and director like, yeah theater director, director yes absolutely yeah. yeah and of course earlier uh, the gentleman who called him laddie is richard griffiths who is the uh harry potter's dad or human dad oh, that's Muppet right dad. that's who yeah. i knew he was familiar i couldn't yeah. figure it out that's great yeah and so you know you'll this whole film is littered with incredible actors british actors who you, you will remember from other things but in here in this moment is another reason why as i got older I found a new reverence for the film having served in the military this idea that they have this moment to talk about with reverence the uh, losses of these young men to uh, to England and what it meant and giving these young guys a weight to carry to understand they have a responsibility here to make up for these men who had been here and couldn't take advantage of the situation you are in because they got called to war I love that talk about a lot to lay on someone yeah it's true very you know. true it's just it's it's the, well and, and it's funny one of the themes of this film that isn't huge but is definitely there is pride in your country after the pain and disaster of the war yeah you know that becomes a very important smaller theme i would say yeah agree um and then we head off to what looks like the joining the club scene. Um, <laughs> and we're in a steady cam shot. This is early steady cam, um, 1980. And we're going through this whole world of all of the clubs. And we see the cricket club and we see, you know, different social clubs and we see the Fabian society. Uh, and we walk up to where they are singing some Gilbert and Sullivan and Harold joins right in. The enemy of the enemy of boys. I really love me some Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, and for those of you eagle eye watchers of the movie, you will see a young Stephen Fry amongst the Footlights Parade people that are dancing mm. and singing. And you'll see a, a uncredited uh, extra cameo from Kenneth Branagh, who's in the background wow. as well when you're watching the movie. You can go Google it and there's pictures of where he is in the movie. Exactly. Oh. You can absolutely see him if you stop at a certain moment. But That is hilarious. 
Yeah, this is a great, great sequence. I enjoy. I mean, the footlights singing like this. I mean, it, it for me as an Anglophile, this there is a, a a jealousy that I would have loved to have been alive at this time and been allowed to go to the school and experience all of that. And the fact that he has signed up for like nine thousand clubs and Harold still goes, oh, only these many. This seems like a <laughs> little amount. It's just incredible to think about the amount of time that they were spending being part of so many different things and studying as well, and being athletes. It's it's almost mind-blowing to think about. Well, Harold Harold Abrams was, from everything I've read, a ridiculous overachiever. In addition yeah. to the incredible discipline of his running, he was an excellent student. He really was a great singer. He really loved performing. He, was, he did it all. Yeah. Um, and what we hear at the end of this sequence is that he has challenged the college dash. College dash. Um, and they're kind of like, well, what's the big deal about that? And like, well, the big deal is that in 700 years, nobody's ever done it, um, <laughs> which I think is not exactly true. It's not. Um, they Someone had done it, but that person wouldn't release his name to be used in the film. So they changed it around to make it uh, Harold. Yes. And the, the name of the man is Lord Burley. Yeah, Burley. And, and Lord Burley is basically who Lindsay, the character of yeah. Lindsay, is sort of based on. He's exactly. kind of an amalgam. And apparently, first of all, Lord Burley was uh, r- really regretted not letting them use his name in the movie. Uh, he was still alive in 1980 when this film was made. Uh, and also, when he actually did the courtyard, the college dash, it was actually in 1927. It was three years yeah. after this. Um, but they gave it to Harold. And again, this is a thing I totally remembered from when I was a kid. And what they say is, is that the challenge is to run all around this courtyard in the time it takes the school bell to toll 12, you know, 12 noon. I say, Browns, what have you got in your feet, rockets? <laughs> and it is, you know, as a freshman who's yeah. just shown up, a pretty arrogant thing. And he's kind of getting himself ready. And then we go up to this room overlooking the courtyard and there is uh, Lindsay, is it Anderson? Is that his name? Yeah, Lindsay Anderson, yeah. Lindsay Anderson and Sir John Gilgood <laughs> looking the down ultimate, at them. Yeah. The ultimate of British aristocracy, John Gilgood, yes. <laughs> this was the first day of the shoot. <laughs> oh, really? And wow. Hugh Hudson, who had never directed actors, I mean, he had directed commercials, Right. Suddenly, his first day is with Lindsay Ans- Anderson, a famous acting teacher and theater director, and yeah. Sir John Gilgood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a story, by the way, from Lindsay Anderson. Lindsay Anderson wasn't really an actor. Yeah, he trained right. actors, but he wasn't actually an experienced film actor. And he had directed John Gilgood in several productions. So he goes up to Gilgood and says, you know, John, do you, do you want to go? Can we go like run lines? And Gilgood says, no, I know my lines. I <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to punish him a little bit for all of the tough times he had been given when he acted in plays for this guy. Um, That's brilliant. Who's Abrahams? What do you know about him? Repton chap. Jewish. His father's a financier in the city. Financier? What's that supposed to mean, I wonder? And that is not uh, looked on with a lot of love or respect. Mm-hmm. And what do they say about the son? Academically sound arrogant, defensive to the point of pugnacity. Mm, as they invariably are. As they invariably are. Yeah. Which is, of course, an underhanded shot at, uh, at um, you know, Jewish people. And also him saying the financier, I think, is a bit of a Sherlock situation too, kind of reminiscent of that as well. The idea of money, handling money. So course, all the, yeah. all the anti-Semitism is in this conversation, uh, you know, here. What what's so interesting to me, and particularly because this is the this is the end of a certain kind of aristocracy, this era. Yes, post World War One. World War One's really what destroys it. Yep. And it's so interesting to me as an American. And Americans, we worship people who make money. Yeah, you know, yeah. those are yeah. some of the the big heroes. And for a long time, uh, people who made money were looked down upon by the aristocracy. They were the bourgeoisie. They were not classy. What was classy was to have money, but not work for it. Right. Just such a weird Old money. And uh, what you just pointed out, Steve, will be what Abram says to them later on in the film when he's confronted about Sam Mussambini, uh, which we'll get to later, obviously. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, this is a film. It is a film about anti Semitism. Mm. It is also a film about classism. That's yeah. definitely a strong, strong theme in the film. Do they say you can run? Like the wind. 
We're back outside, and who comes up but Lindsay, Lord <laughs> Lindsay? I love him so much. He's so he is great. So great. Yeah. Shows Not up true, with, Mr. Skyler. <laughs> with a bottle of champagne and with a cigarette in his mouth. I raced beside my friend here. We challenged in the name of Repton, Eaton, and Keith. <laughs> I didn't know you ran, nor are you. Some chap told me about this shindig over breakfast. I thought I'd come and push you along a bit, huh? It's like it's no big deal to him, which is yeah. old money versus new money, right? Old money, yeah. effortless list. New money is like determined, you know? Well, I mean, Lindsay has it all. He doesn't yeah, have anything to prove. He's yes. a freaking lord. <laughs> you know? And I love, he just says, I, and he doesn't even really expect to be able to do it. He just says, no. I'm just here to push you on a bit. And there's a great build to the run as we hear the chimes and students like kind of make these corridors and then they go. And it is a great, great race. Abrams in the lead and then Lindsay's in the lead and then Abrams takes the lead again. There's that final moment and they make it. Abrams wins and I love the students chanting five, four, yeah. six. Seven, like I love that they're doing that. It kind of adds more to the mood, but yes, Abrams does it. And we go back up to our old men and they say, the first man in seven centuries. Perhaps they really are God's chosen people after all. <laughs> and it's certainly said with such disdain, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and then we have just a great, this is a great line to cut on because you say, I doubt if there's a swifter man in the kingdom. Cut to Scotland. And we're at some kind of gathering and we see some kids go off on a race. Eric Little is the guy who f fires the starting pistol and we watch the race. And then after the race, everyone runs up to this guy for an autograph. Maybe your best friend, Sandy, but he's my best brother. His heart's set on following father in the mission. Do you not think he's got enough on his plate without taking up racing? It's fast, Jenny, really fast. You've seen yourself with a ball in his hands. And I've seen him with a Bible in his hands. I know which is the most important. It's it's fantastic because this is the beginning of what we will see between both of these gentlemen, right? Harold Abrams runs to honor his religion and to make people stand up and take notice and respect his religion. Uh, little runs uh, to as an extension of his religion, uh, you know. And we hear this later. What we need now is a muscular Christian. So they're both running for not just country and themselves, but as representations of their religion and to ex to to uh, reach the heights uh, and, and, and give it respect uh, back again. And I love that. I, different ways. I don't know the answer to this, but mm. my suspicion, and maybe this is me putting my own thing on it. Mm. I don't think, her so one of the weird things about being Jewish is it is both a religion and a culture. It is both mm. a, 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 a set of beliefs and a, and a group. I don't think Harold is religious. And I, oh, I, right. And I don't, so I don't think he's, I think he might be running for the Jewish people, but he's okay. not running for the Jewish God. Fair enough. Faith Fair doesn't enough. play a real part in his way of thinking about the world. Right. You know, but, yeah. but there's no question that he as a Jew is central yes. to his character. You know, it's actually a, a thing I wish I knew the answer to of like, what was his religious beliefs? We never see him do anything no, religious. No, practice it. Yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I don't even, I mean, I don't even know he might eat that pig trotter later on in the movie. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> well, as with Little, we see him practicing it throughout the movie. That is the, yeah, it's good it is the core driving principle mm -hmm. of his life. It's often said that giving beats receiving. Well, let me tell you, the look of delight in those little boys' faces are worth 10 of any of the tin pots I've got gathering dust in my Edinburgh sideboard. <laughs> and he's just lovely. Ian Charlson, who plays this part, oh, He's so deft and gentle. Mm. You just like him. He's so welcoming as a human. Yeah. Um, uh, he's an amazing character. And from everything I read, Eric Little really was. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I have a book. I just bought recently bought a uh, biography of his that I'm going to read a paperback that I'm going to read on him. Um, and by the way, this is Ian Charleston, who was also in Gandhi. For those of you who might remember uh -huh. Gandhi, he plays the uh, Catholic priest who goes down to India to uh, help Gandhi for a, a, a good part of the movie. It's funny. That's another movie I saw a ton in the 80s and haven't seen mm -hmm. in decades. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I see. And I, I watch it every six months. Man. I, I, I know. Well, it, clearly it's one we're going to have to do. Yeah. Um, at some point. I mean, and, and Gandhi is, you know, among my great heroes. So, mm -hmm. so definitely we should get into some Gandhi at some point. Agreed. Hey, Mr. Promise, sir, before you allow Eric here to go, 
Is it not true that the main event of the meeting is still to be run? And they kind of push him into running the race. And the sister is not pleased about this. Nope. But the crowd wants it, and we go to the start, and it's in slow motion. Tremendous use of slow motion in this film. It's one of the criticisms that there are people. Really? Yeah, that people go, they overuse slow motion. I love the way they use slow motion in this film. Me too. Very unique. You want to know who uses over slow, uh, overuses slow motion? Peter Jackson in the Lord of the Rings <laughs> movies. I hate every slow motion movie in that in those moment in those movies. I love them in this movie. And he's running in freaking slacks. Yeah. Uh, wool slacks, no less, and suspenders, for God's sakes. Um, and the, the way he runs, I mean, how, how can we talk about this? Yeah. Like the, and, uh, the head back, the arms are flailing. And it's so funny because uh, I was reading, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was reading one of these uh, uh, interviews and they did it uh, with, I think it was Putnam or Hudson. And they asked him about Eric Little and they showed it for his family and his sister. And his sister said, you got him completely correct, except for the running. And it threw them off because they had watched all these, right. all old this films. footage of Eric. Of old, yeah. And so they made sure Ian completely imitated. And they said, one of the things that we knew we got right was his running. And the fact that the sister felt that we didn't, it, it put them like, it floored them that they, wow. uh, they couldn't change it by then. Of course. Because the film had been edited, was coming out, but they were floored that she thought they didn't get the running style right. And if you watch Eric Little's uh, races, uh, Ian Charlson does such a fantastic job imitating him uh, that it's hard to believe. But you know, the people who know you the most know those little intricacies that make the difference. Well, and this is where you get into this thing we talked about many times of like big T truth and little T truth right. is like, was it perfectly exactly his physicality? <laughs> no. Does it m- profoundly move you in the movie? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like nothing I've ever seen and combined with the music and combined with the slow-mo. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's weird to think that watching a human run can be moving. Yeah. Right. And yet it is. Uh, and then we have this conversation with dad, which I think is really interesting. And dad is the, you know, is the minister, is the guy who founded the mission. And he says, The kingdom of God is not a democracy. The Lord never seeks re-election. There's one right, one wrong, one absolute ruler. A dictator, you mean? Aye, but a benign, loving dictator. I think that establishes so much about their worldview, about Eric's worldview. It, it gives you a window into, yes, Steve, the Littles' worldview of religion and how they approach it and how they look at it. I, I've always kept the benevolent dictator in my head since I was 11 years old and I saw this movie and thought to myself, "This is is that ever possible? A benevolent dictator, I wonder. Well, if it's God, if it's Jesus, mm. in the conception of this particular version of that religion. Yes. It's not only possible, it is the truth. Yeah. And then the next thing that happens is a kid comes by playing with a ball. Oh, hey, hey, hey. Do you know what day it is? Yeah. Tell me then. Sunday. Sabbath's not a day for playing football, is it? No. Yeah, this is a perfect plant. I mean. (laughs) Yeah, good point. um, Yes. And later on, there's we're with the family. And now we're facing this choice. Does he pursue running, which he has a true gift for, and the friend really wants him to, or does he go back to missionary work in China? What we need now is a muscular Christian to make folks sit up and notice. We cut to a race, and there are like coal miners or something watching, and we hear a choir, and... We see Eric and and his sister, they're singing at a church meeting, and then we cut to him running in that race in the rain. Mm-hmm. It's a great, great shot. And I believe that it just really rained. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. It wasn't planned, and it, this is my understanding. And one of the things, it's a 10-week shoot. They shot six days a week, which was really unusual <laughs> at that time. And the thing you have to under, you know, union shoots don't shoot six days a week. They shoot five. Independent films more often shoot six days a week because they just don't have the money. But the thing about six-day weeks that you have to understand is that if you have a film shooting six days a week, the director, the producer, the uh, line producer, the unit production manager, the director of photography, the ADs, they're working seven days a week. Yeah, Because true. that day off, that's the day you're prepping for the next week. 
Mm-hmm. So there is no time off. It's seven days a week, and film shoots are long hours. These are 12, 14, 15 hour days, seven days a week. This is brutal. And what uh, Hugh Hudson said was they had to make their day, which means they had whatever they had on the schedule, they had to get it shot. Rain, sun, disaster, whatever it was, they had no margin for error. Uh, he wins the race, and then he makes a speech. You came to see a race today, to see someone win. Happened to be me. Great. Great line. Love that. But I want you to do more than just watch your race. I want you to take part in it. I want to compare faith to running in a race. This speech is remarkable. Yeah. And what I didn't realize, and maybe you knew, is that this was this was rewritten in the car with Ian and Hugh Hudson on the day. I did not know that. Wow. They the okay. apparently the original speech was very flowery and mm. big sort of religious talk. And Ian came to Hugh Hudson and said, I think it would be simpler. It's got to be something simpler. And apparently, in addition to his running training, he had been Bible training. Mm. He had been reading the Bible cover to cover uh, for months. And so he and Hugh came up with this right on the day. And in fact, they literally went out and shot it right after they wrote it. And he didn't have time to memorize all the lines. So the lines, the speech is written in his hat that he's holding and you'll see a couple of moments where he kind of looks down at his hat in the scene. I love it. I love it. Make it work however you can. So who am I to say, believe, have faith in the face of life's realities. I have no formula for winning the race. Everyone runs in our own way or his own way. And then we get to the line. Then where does the power come from to see the race to its end? from within love that i love that it's so uh, i would put that speech on par with any sports speech you hear in any movie it is so more so much more about um so much it's more more than just the race it's about life you know and most sports speeches speeches can be related to life so this one qualifies what he's talking about yeah he's talking about faith we talk about life, this idea of like, where does it come? Uh, the strength comes from within to be able to survive, to be able to cross that tape, to be able to finish the race, you know? And I think it's such a beautifully written speech and inspirational speech as well. And you can feel the way he says it from within, you know? It's like that, trying to motivate you, you know? And uh, that's part of, you know, it's part of how he administered religion to these people that probably made him so beloved uh, in the country. It's interesting. I, I, I have so many thoughts from what mm-hmm. you said. One of them, you know, we just did Field of Dreams. Yeah. And um, one of the things we said in that podcast is that the really good sports movies are always about something more than sports. Oh, yeah. And and this one, is certainly sports are at the center of it, but it's about faith and about right. discipline and the contrast between these two characters. And I think that moment of where does the strength come from, from within, Um is such a statement about his life because anyone who's pursued anything that is difficult, anyone that's pursued anything where the odds are against them has had those moments of defeat, has had to deal with strain and pain and loss and a sense of hopelessness. And the people that succeed are the people who get up and keep fighting. And And again, where does that strength come from? And what we'll see in this film, and that's why it's such an interesting movie, is you have these two people who are both tremendously strong. Yeah. And their strength, I think, comes from very different places. Yeah, did you say Ian wrote, Ian Charlson wrote this with Hugh Hudson in the car? Is that that's what you my, said? That's my understanding, yeah. Well, I mean, you could compare that speech to directing a movie, isn't it? This idea of, sure. uh, you know, having to, you know, have faith. You don't know what the end result's going to be, that kind of thing. But where does it come to finish? So maybe a little bit of his own personal experience as he's making this movie crept its way into that speech as well. We just sure. talked about six days a week, seven days a week, fighting yeah. rain, fighting budgets, fighting time, fighting all yeah. that stuff. Absolutely. You got to have faith, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know I said this before, but the thing I kept telling myself when we did the assistance, which was, you know, working seven days a week mm-hmm. and had been years of work up to that point was I just kept saying, I got to leave it all in the court. You know, mm-hmm. every time, every time a disaster happened and there were tons, every time we had to deal with something, every time I had to stay up all night and keep working, it was just like, leave it all in the court. Don't, yeah. don't quit. Don't quit. If you commit yourself to the love of Christ, then that is how you run the straight race. 
And then remarkably, this is really remarkable if they didn't plan the rain. Oh, the yeah. The <laughs> sun comes out. The sun yeah. comes out at the end of the scene. I think they catch their authentic reactions too. Like they're yeah. just like, oh, oh, it's like, oh, and it's like it's so fascinatingly real. Yeah, this is the simplicity of Ian Charlson's performance is what what makes it so profound. And then, and again, at at the moment of the most beatific, spiritual, hopeful, loving Ian Charlson, we hear Harold say, "It's an ache." Yeah. And we cut to him and Aubrey, and he is expressing himself in a way that is so honest. And, and, and his love for this other man is so clear, you know, that his trust of him. Because I don't think he has told people his feelings like this. Sometimes I say to myself, hey, steady on, you're imagining all this. And then I catch that look again. Catch it on the edge of her own mark. Feel a cold reluctance in a handshake. And I love this moment. Is there's a there's a photograph of his father like on the mantle and he points to him and says that's my father, and he, his description of him is he's a Lithuanian Jew he is mm -hmm. alien he's as foreign as a Frankfurter, and his <laughs> friend says and a kosher one, kosher at, that. one at that, and there is and a look yeah, <laughs> Harold looks at him and and the, there's an instant well of anger, and you see his friend realize that he is yeah, just yeah. I mean it, it, Harold was just talking about anti-semitic <laughs> comments and things like that and he just kind of made one yeah. and and there's a look just so and, casually just so casually yeah. and then Harold bursts out laughing and they both laugh together mm -hmm. I love that moment so much um and I think I really believe that your friends can give you shit in a way that and they can really poke at a real thing, mm -hmm. but in a way that makes you feel loved, yep. not hurt. Whereas if someone who didn't know you said that thing, it would be like, well, you know, how right? Because there's not there's not an ill intention in the comment. And exactly, he's not, and, and he and he's so shocked he even made it, which is so great. But it also symbolizes their growing friendship, the strength of their growing friendship as well, totally, which is important throughout the movie. Um, and, and, and the last thing he says about his father is just he, he expresses his love and admiration for this guy yeah. who basically worked and worked. It's a classic immigrant story. He yeah. worked and worked and worked so his kids could have a better life. His, his, yeah. The other son, the other, his brother is a doctor, top of his field, and that here he is at Cambridge in, in one of the, in the finest university of the land. You know, yeah. what a life this Lithuanian Jew has given his family. Yeah. And then in another scene, we basically continue in on the same conversation. This England of his is Christian and Anglo Saxon. And so are her corridors of power. And those who stalk them guard them with jealousy and venom. And, and this is him setting up his demons or his dragons for him to slay, for himself to slay, right? He's saying this. Because what my old man didn't know was all of this. So he sees himself as a war, as like a knight, a warrior to, for his people. I'm going to take them on, all of them, one by one, and run them off their feet. And then we go to Gilbert. <laughs> yeah, with he is an English man. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny thinking about, you know, what gives you the strength to see the race to the end it's from within. Right. Well, this is his strength. Yep. And it is totally different from Eric Little. It is complete. It is, there is anger and defiance and self-righteousness and, and not just self-righteousness, but righteousness. Yes. You know, it, he has something to prove. I don't think Eric Little has anything to prove. Uh, just when he runs, he feels God's pleasure. Right to you him, know? it's it's producing it's uh, proving his dedication to his faith, uh, and that will come uh, later on in the movie. But yes, he does not run to prove anything. The only thing he feels the need to prove is his dedication to his faith, and it isn't even a, a like an a, a conscious proof. It's a it's just logical to him. I, I, again, it's like, and I'm I'm quibbling about words, but I'm mm. thinking about it. Is that I don't think he has. I don't think he feels he has to prove his dedication to his mm. faith. He is dedicated to his faith, mm. but you his know? sister questions him, and that's the that's. I don't the think she questions. She doesn't question his faith. 
Well, she says it, but I do fret for you, Eric. I fret for what it all might do to you. That's true. Your mind's not with us, son. That's Your true. Your mind's not, it's on racing and blah, blah, blah. So she is always throughout the movie questioning his dedication to his faith. Uh, and so it's what he struggles with, you know, it's his conflict. And then we go into this montage of seeing Harold running and great successes and newspaper mm. articles and different kinds of runs. And uh, great month. And then we have him singing in the choir, or doing some Gilbert, <laughs> singing his Gilbert and Sullivan. And then we cut to the race between Scotland and France, and we see hear the bagpipes, and Harold is there in the stands. Yeah. And we hear the Marseillaise played on bagpipes, which is interesting to hear. <laughs> um, and Harold is there looking for Eric Little, and he spots him. I love that he's in like a long coat. You yeah. know, at the warm ups, it's just kind of cool. And there is Ian Holm. Yeah. Sam Musabini. I think he's, I think he's, he doesn't steal every scene that he's in. I, th but I do think his performance is the greatest in the film. He's essential to this movie in so many ways, Steve, because he brings, for lack of a better term, a gravitas to the movie because he is presented as a, veteran of racing and what he represents to Harold is the ability to go and get this gold medal and what he represents with Eric Little in this scene is the acceptance of uh the talent of this young man so his um kind of veteran actor status vibe works so well in the movie and this is what a year after Alien literally two years gonna after say exactly the same thing yeah um, uh, and because I was thinking about it, it's like, okay, it is, it's a year after Alien and the, yeah. and the character he plays couldn't be more different. Completely. And what occurred to me thinking about it and watching him in this film is like, man, he might be one of the great underrated actors of all time. Absolutely. One of the greatest character actors uh, ever, because I don't think you've ever led a film, but he's one of the most, he's one of the greatest character actors you'll, in, in any movie he's in. He just elevates it. And one of the guys, who's obviously the guy who runs the race, comes up to him and immediately throws some shade on him. Because <laughs> mentions like, oh, you can stay here, but you know we have a strict amateur policy. And the look that Ian throws him <laughs> is just so like, yeah, I know. I love the comment at the end where he says, enjoy the games. He goes, games? You must be joking. I've seen better organized riots. <laughs> That's just a great, great line. And the race starts, and Eric is running, and Harold is watching intensely, mm. and... Eric gets pushed out of the race and falls. And it's in slow motion and Harold is staring at him and Ian has his stopwatch and he says, get up, lad. Get up, lad, get up. It's such a brilliant use from Hugh Hudson of silence. Yeah. The right just takes everything out. You just, because the shock, and I remember it being 11 years old, Steve, in that movie theater when this moment happened shocked just shocked that this would happen in a race and then when he's like get up lad get up you're just like oh my god is this really gonna happen and then it goes and you're just like oh wow and again that head goes back and it's so yeah. moving to me and he comes from behind and he wins the race and then collapses because mm -hmm. you know talk about leaving it all on the court i mean like right. every single thing that he had every bit of of strength he put into this race yeah. and ian comes up and kind of gives him space and holds up his head and i and i just love this mo and, and by the way i'm crying let's be really clear yeah at this yeah. moment in the film it was not the prettiest quarter i've ever seen mr little certainly the bravest by the way, this is great believability, right? If you were to do something like this, you wouldn't be just crossing this finish line. <sighs> You'd be legitimately out of yeah. breath and collapsed on the ground, which I loved that they added this bit of realism in the movie at this point. And, they, and, and we also have to say that Harold Abrams is watching this. Yeah. And what he sees, it's clear that what he sees is unlike anything he's ever seen. He crunches that program yeah. out of just like, what? There's someone with more determination than me that exists under the same flag? Well, and I think his thought is, I couldn't have done that. Yeah, possibly. You know? Yeah. Or or, or maybe, maybe, maybe more accurately, it's, I don't know if I could have done that. I think that's probably yeah. even more accurate. Yeah, the uh, fear. Yeah. Well, and this is the thing. I don't think Eric Little is afraid. Mm -hmm. Harold is afraid. Yes. He's afraid many times in this film. Yes. You know, and, and fear drives him just as anger drives him. I've never seen such drive, 
Such commitment in a runner. He runs like a wild animal. He unnerves me. So he should. So he should. I, which I think is so great I th- that he, that yeah. uh, Musabimi says that. And, and he says he frightens the living daylights out of me. And then he imitates the way he runs, mm. right? It's just like, oh, so they all get it, what this guy is, you know? Yes, well, I want you to help me take him on. <laughs> I love Musabimi's reaction because he goes like, are you married? Because if you're married, you know, the, the, how would you feel if your future wife asked you to marry her? You know, like <laughs> the coach is supposed to do the asking. The coach is doing the asking. I love the switch in him. And he, he immediately makes the switch and then goes into this story which or this uh, thing, which is brilliant. Yeah. And, and I think Harold... Harold he do, first of all, he does nothing without thinking it through. Mm-hmm. He has mm-hmm. thought through this. He has made a decision, and then he comes and sa- and he has a very good understanding of who he is. Mr. Masabini, I can run fast. With your help, I think I can run even faster. Perhaps faster than any man ever ran. I want that Olympic medal. Now I can see it there. It's waiting for me. But I can't get it on my own. Mosabimi's response is, well, I have a saying, you can't put in what God's left out. I'll watch you, I'll observe. And if I think I can help, believe me, I won't waste any time. When we meet again, I'll be the one that does the begging. So you will watch me? Son, if you're good enough, I'll take you apart piece by bloody piece. And what's great is Harold smiles. Of course, because... That's what he wants. The determine. That's what he wants. The determination to win. He expects to be whipped into, uh, not literally, obviously, but expects to be whipped into shape to be able to accomplish his goal. He knows what he wants to accomplish. He knows he can't do it following the regular amateur approach to this thing. He knows he needs outside help. And Mosambini is the guy to bring him that gold medal. So the smile is a smile of, yes, I've recruited an even stronger soldier on my team or, or general on my team to help me get that goal. And, you know, people who do that, they understand. Well, and what's so interesting to me, again, it's the contrast, is that nobody's yeah. telling Eric Little how to run. In fact, if you tried to tell him how to run, you'd probably ruin him, Mm -hmm. you know, because he runs on faith. He runs on instinct. He runs on this feeling, on emotion. He's an organic runner. Harold, who's a great runner, he has done it by discipline and hard work. And I'm sure you've had something where you were pretty good at it. And then someone in teaching, coaching you made you do it a different way. Yep. And and what happens inevitably when you try to do the thing you've done a lot a different way is you are now horrible at it. <laughs> the thing that was easy for you to do before is now really, really hard. In or, again, this is where does the strength come from? You have to be lousy at a thing that you love and are good at for a long time before you can get good at it again in the new way. Tiger Woods always was working on his swing. If you see, not to use that, you know, obviously, whatever you're feeling, but Tiger was always working on his swing at the expense of his game. He could have stayed where he was, but he wanted to get even better. And so in those, when if you read his history, the struggles he went through was to kind of constantly be chasing being the best golfer to ever play the game. Well, and you say the same about Michael Jordan. You can say yes. the same about, there's so many people where it's like, yeah. the again, I, I'm going to just keep saying the same line over and over again. Where does the strength come from? Mm-hmm. And, and I think it comes from a different place with Tiger Woods, probably a different place from Michael Jordan, certainly a different place from our two characters in this film. Right now, the place we're going to go to is the theater and hear some Gil- more Gilbert and Sullivan. And we're going to meet Sybil, who's singing yeah. Three Little Maids. <laughs> and by the way, this is a small budget. Mm. They couldn't fill a theater. <laughs> They had enough people for that. They put our main characters in the box. That's all there is. There's nobody in this theater. It's totally empty. And we're looking at this girl. Didn't I tell you? Is she a peach? She's magnificent. And at the end of the act, Abrams jumps to his feet. By the way, do you notice they call him Abraham and Abrams throughout the yeah, film? Yeah, yeah. And I yeah, really wonder what, the pronunciation. what that is. I really... I, Maybe it's an English pronunciation, like certain people from certain regions mm. pronounce it a certain way, certain people from other regions pronounce it another way. I don't know. Well, the thing that I wondered, I I don't know this at all, but I was like, mm. Abraham's, to me, sounds more Jewish. Abraham's yeah. sounds less Jewish. Great and, I, and I wonder if there's something in there. I don't know that it is. It's the intermission, and our guys are, who have now obviously become good friends, are drinking champagne. Abraham's smitten, you say. Oh, smitten is decapitated. He won't listen to reason. Reason? The poor lad's in love. He's only just set eyes on her. I've worshipped her for years. 
<laughs> this is such a this is such a guy moment. It's, it's so great. Well, it's it's a guy moment, but it's such a British upper yeah, class, it, right? Because we're with right. our champagne and our tuxedos. By the way, where is he now? He's gone to ask her out to dinner. Has he, by Joe? In the interval. And Harold comes back. I love the way Ben Cross plays this. <laughs> he's like trying to contain what he's yeah. just done. And they like, did you speak to her? Yes. Is she coming? Yes. To dinner? Yes. She has a kid brother, athletics mad, never stops talking about me, she says. And apparently, Aubrey, I think it is, he was into her. So yes. he just came in and swiped the girl that this guy has been in love with for years. And not only that, takes Aubrey's drink. Uh, and drinks it, <laughs> he takes it out of Aubrey's uh, digital. He, he does it figuratively and literally. And once again, this is a great example of Harold Abrams' approach, Abrams' approach to um, his life. He is New England, new representation of English, right? He, the old aristocracy, would never have gone during the intermission no. to go and ask a woman out. He is so determined and aggressive in his approach to the life that he thinks nothing of going uh, in the intermission and asking uh, the lead actress out uh, to dinner. And by the way, that's Alice Krieg, who is the Borg queen in First Contact. Oh, so nice. yeah, that's, uh, one of those she, first few she, films she did. She's really good in this. Oh, she's fantastic. And we head off to a restaurant where people applaud as they walk in. W one thing I wanted to talk about, she's wearing a gorgeous, beautiful dress. And yeah. all the costumes are beautiful. Here's the thing about these costumes. So this movie, they, they went in England and then you go and the costume people reserve a bunch of mm -hmm. vintage clothing or maybe costumes that have been made for other films. And they say, okay, in three months, we're going to be shooting this film. Then we're going to reserve all these costumes. Mm -hmm. Well, the movie that was shooting before them had also reserved these costumes, but it was supposed to be done in time, so it wouldn't be a problem. That movie was Warren Beatty's Reds. Oh. And that movie went on and on and on. So by the time Chariots of Fire went to shoot, they had no costumes. <laughs> so they had to scramble because Reds had told, taken all their costumes to find all these clothes. <laughs> and they did a beautiful job. I mean, yeah. but period pieces are hard. Bit off tonight, I thought. What? You were magnificent. It's obviously she's a regular at the restaurant and the waiter knows who she is and she has her special drink and they bring the special drink and he drinks it. It's delicious. And she says when they have the menu, you know, I'm just going to have my usual. And Abram says, make it two. <laughs> Why running? Why singing? My job. No, that's silly. I do it because I love it. You love running. His answer is fascinating to me. I'm more of an addict. It's a compulsion, a weapon. Against what? Being Jewish, I suppose. And she th she laughs. Yeah. Because she doesn't understand it. She says, you're not serious. Which there is a segment of people who, of course, are not racist, who think it's odd that that would be the situation, that people would look at someone who's Jewish and somehow deem them less than worthy. And so for her in that moment, that's her reaction. Because... That's she's a good person immediately. She's his fiddlesticks. People don't care because she doesn't care. Yeah, she doesn't care. And that's a positive about her. Well, and the thing is, is I can't know what you experienced with your immigrant parents. Mm. I mean, I can listen to you. Right, right, right. But I can't feel it because I haven't experienced that. And it's funny, like I've experienced very little anti-Semitism. I've mm. been in rooms where people have made comments you know, they, they, I've heard the expression, oh, they, they Jewed him down, you know. I've, I've heard things like that, or, or you, know, you know how Jews mm -hmm. are. You know, I've heard like those kind of statements, but they've never been really directed at me. Right. Like I haven't, I haven't lost out on a job because I was Jewish, and I haven't not been allowed to go somewhere because I'm Jewish. You know, growing up in California at the time that I've grown up, it's not the biggest thing, but I will say, with things that have happened in the world recently, it's the yes. first time where I've suddenly gone, oh, there's there's a guy who shot up a synagogue, you know, mm -hmm. or, or or in you know Charlottesville's, you know, chanting Jews will not replace us. Yeah. Suddenly I go, oh shit, it's still around. Yeah. And there was a sign at the Huntington Beach protest the other day, Jewish Star of David. In the middle, it said, "This is the real virus." I didn't know. I didn't know that one. And that that's the thing. It's it never goes away. People need a scapegoat because if they don't have a scapegoat, they have to actually look at themselves for the failures in their life. And they couldn't possibly be at fault 
It has to be someone else's fault. It has to be another person who's doing this to me or a race or whatever. And so that's the limited, unintelligent thinking. And that's what fuels racism, obviously. Well, and sometimes it's not or fear. Sometimes it's not even they need to look at themselves. You just got to look at the problem, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the, the issue of, you know, Jews are the real virus. I don't even know how I'm going to deal with that. But like, yeah. you know, the issues in wherever we use scapegoats are way more complicated than just blaming that other person or blaming yourself. It's like, no, you actually have to solve this problem. Um, anyway, she says, anyway, being Jewish hasn't done you any harm because he's a successful guy from mm. a wealthy father who dresses really well, who's going to Cambridge, who's a world famous runner. And he says, I'm semi deprived. That's clever. What does that mean? It means they lead me to water, but they won't let me drink. It's a great line. It is a great line. And I think it is true and not true. I think it definitely is true. When you deal with the Gil Goods and some of those people, mm. he definitely is right at the edge of the water. But se- yeah. And he's kind of in the club, but yeah. not fully in the club. I think it's totally true. But I also think his, this, his being difficult, as I said at the beginning of this mm-hmm. podcast, mm-hmm. he prevents himself from participating on some levels too. It's great. They have a great instant connection. Mm-hmm. It's very romantic right away. And one of the things that Hugh Hudson encouraged, now I forget the actress's name again. Alice Krieg. He encourages her to do other things to add a little energy to the scene. Mm. He didn't exactly tell her what to do. What she chose to do was take her shoe off, take her foot, and put it up against his crotch <laughs> during this scene. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. That adds a little romance, let's say. I'm sure, absolutely. And, and what ru- what comes up in the middle of the romance? The waiter with the pig trotters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and it's, you know what? It's like the scene with Aubrey about the coach yes. of Frankfurter. Is there's a moment and then they share the moment and laugh about it. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, I don't think I've eaten pig trotters. I've eaten pig's ears. I've what? had nipples of Venus. I've had ve- nipples of Venus. <laughs> uh, it's just, it was like our third movie we ever did. <laughs> we'll revisit that one maybe one day as well. Maybe, yeah. Do a seven-hour um, di- seven episode. Jesus. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, we're on the train. Eric Little is waking up. And what we basically get to is that there's a newspaper, and he is going to be racing Harold Abram today. We're in the locker room, and Little, in his coat, walks up to Harold and introduces himself and says, Mr. Abraham, Mr. Little, I'd like to wish you the best of success. Thank you. And may the best man win. I think that's very interesting. See, Eric is being the gentleman, but Harold doesn't, like, Harold is so... You know, when he's game day, it's game day, you know, and even with the gentlemanly moment, he in, in, um, uh, injects it with this competitiveness exactly. that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Well, I think Eric, Eric actually means he actually wished yeah. him the best of success. Yes. That he's actually saying that. And that's <laughs> not how Harold, you know, he, he doesn't have that gear. He can't understand this person. No, but I think what Harold says is actually what he means to may the best man win, uh, you know, in his mind, you know. It's the race, there's the start, and Eric Little wins. It's over so quick. And it's really quick. This is part of the great use of slow-mo, is they know when not to use it. Like, this is a fast race. (laughs) It happens really fast, and Harold is just destroyed. Yeah. Just completely, completely destroyed. And I like Um, the score cue here as well, Steve, him seeing it over and over again in the... The, the, the notes that are being hit mm-hmm. here is just this kind of like, it makes it feel, because he's a slow motion, but the, it makes it almost ethereal, like he's lost in the uh, uh, thoughts of his mind, like he's in, in outer space and he's mi- lost in his thoughts and things of that nature. So I enjoy this uh, this music cue at this time with this scene. Well, the thing I love too is that he's sitting in the stands yeah, and then we hear this noise, this clap, clap, clap. Oh, that's brilliant. Clap. Right? Yeah. And then we realize that this is the guy folding up the seats Mm -hmm. and that Harold has been sitting here for a long, long time. Yeah. And and, and I think this is typical of Harold is that if he does make a mistake, which he rarely does, Mm -hmm. 
he thinks about it forever. Yes. It, it's funny. You had said before, when we were talking about this film a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and talked about who you are and that you really relate mm -hmm. to Harold. And I kind of went, I don't. And, and, and I was trying to figure out who I related to. It's like, no, I'm Harold. I'm a different aspect of Harold, I think, from you. Like the hard work, obsessing about mistakes, perfectionism, all that, you know, discipline, taking the thing apart, putting it back together, taking it apart, putting it back together, figuring out how to do better, never being satisfied. That's, that's, yeah. that's my shit, you know? Yeah, it's funny you bring this up now because this scene is the ultimate John Roca scene in the movie when he um, has this conversation with Sybil when he's rethinking it. Cause Lord knows um, from any competition I've re you can overthink an audition to pieces. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you can overthink an interview to pieces. You can overthink anything I did uh, you know, any piece I've written or any interview I've done with anybody or any job interview I've had, or even in the schmodown after my losses, I have sat for days just lost in my own thought before Lindley and I got together, I would lose and just be just lost for two days, just trying to figure out what happened. Uh, and so seeing him sit there, I know that feeling. And every time I see it, I understand. And the, the interaction they have, I totally get where Harold is at. You know, she, she's awesome too. Like I yes, love, I, I love everything she says. First of all, she calls him ridiculous. You know, it's just a race. And then, then she says, I lost. And she's like, I know. I was watching. <laughs> and then she says something that was so great is that it was marvelous. You were marvelous. He was just more marvelous. That's all. On the day, the best man won. Which I love that she says that because she doesn't coddle him. Nope. She's like, no, he was better. He was right. better that day. And he says, well, that's that, Abrams. And she says, well, if you can't take a beating, perhaps it's for the best. I don't run to take beatings. I run to win. If I can't win, I won't run. You don't run, you can't win. And she starts to go, yeah. and he won't let her go. Grabs her hard. Yeah. Not mean, but hard. Well, holding on to her like a like mm -hmm. a, a, something to keep him afloat. Like a life preserver. Absolutely. Exactly. It's not the losing, Sid. Harry Little's a fine man and a fine runner. It's me. And after all that work, now God knows what do I aim for. Beating him the next time. Sybil, I can't run any faster. Oh, Mr. Abrams! There is Ian Holm who says, I can find you another two yards. That's awesome. That's, it's a great ending to that moment because at, at his most despondent, here comes a, the bigger life preserver to you know kind of reignite his passion to run again. And at this moment, I think, as Ian Holm has joined the team of mm -hmm. Harold Abrahams, I think this is a good time to end part one of our exploration of Chariots of Fire. So as always, you can reach us on our Facebook page, do a search for The Cinephiles. You can subscribe to the show at all the usual places, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify. Please leave your reviews on iTunes. They are so important for getting the show out there. We'd love to read your comments on YouTube. If you want to buy Chariots of Fire or any other movie we've ever done, you can buy or stream it on our website, cinephiles.net. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the cinephiles. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cine underscore files on Instagram at the Cinephiles Podcast. I'm on Twitter at SR Morris and on Instagram at SR Morris One. John, how about you? You can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram and running on your local beach uh, there with my uh, England <laughs> shirt on. <laughs> or if you want to follow, if you want to uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, please www.youtube.com slash John Roca says so much great content over there and it's building and building and building. So come join the nation for God's sakes. For God's sake, join the nation. <laughs> and, we, and while you're joining that nation, we will keep working and running for a week and come back next week with part two of Chariots of Fire on the Cinephiles. <laughs>